this evening, I'd like you to first uh, find on your table a, 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 a quiz. We're going to give you an exam. And I would wager to bet that um, in this, on this sheet, you'll find on one column the allergen families we will talk about in very uh, fine detail. And in the other column, you'll find the allergenic components which match with the families. We've selected those allergenic components that, in fact, you will probably encounter in your discussions and in your considerations as you move to incorporate components into your diagnostic testing. And as I go through my presentation, I'd like you to match the family with the allergenic components. And hopefully at the end, you will be prepared when you either take your re-examination or your initial board examination to, um, to know which families these components reside in and in sort of in preparation for um, the emergence of these issues into the exams, which you'll ultimately see in the near future. So I have uh, three, three objectives for today. First, I'd like to review the rationale and the allergen family nomenclature. And then I'd like to examine uh, briefly the technology that we currently have in setting the stage for the, the subsequent two presentations, which will talk about specific details and applications of components in your diagnostic testing. And finally, I will overview an area that they will not cover, which is really the, the implications of components to pollen allergy assessment as a way of sort of broadening the perspective a little bit. So let's talk about the rationale and the allergen family nomenclature. Molecular-based allergy diagnostics, also known as component uh, resolve diagnostics, allow you to map the allergen sensitization pattern of the, of the patient at the molecular level. And we use both natural and recombinant allergenic molecules or components instead of allergenic extracts. And as you know, of the 1,300 or 400 allergen extracts you have available, only 19 are standardized for skin testing. So they're really, really little black boxes. And what the components are allowing us to do is to dissect out the immune response more effectively than, in fact, what we can do with, with the extracts themselves. We will be talking strictly about in, in vitro technology, since you can't use components, at least in the United States, for skin testing. Now, the rationale is really to increase the accuracy of, of allergy diagnosis and prognosis by the use of components. And we do this by resolving or distinguishing between genuine and cross-reactive sensitization in polysensitized individuals. And in food allergy that we will hear later in detail, it facilitates the assessment in some cases of the risk of severe versus mild reactions. And in doing so, can reduce to some extent the, the need for oral allergy challenges. Finally, in, in certain cases, it allows you to identify patients and triggering allergens as you plan better targeted immunotherapy. Now, the 1990s really were the period when we moved into the molecular world, and it really began in Vienna or in Europe with uh, Rudy Valenta presenting the, uh, the initial diagnostic recombinant allergens in panels. And the WHO, with the IOIS, got together and basically decided on a nomenclature. The first three letters of the genus and first letter of the species define the allergen specificity followed by a number. And the reason why you might find this somewhat confusing is because the numbers represent those allergens as they sequentially were identified, and they don't have a, a particular significance with regard to family. So, for example, for CAT, we have FELD1, which most all of you know about, but we also have FELD2 through FELD8. And as you'll hear later, the lipocalins are a very important part of the, of the animal allergen component world, which you'll find primarily in furry animals, but not in pollens and, and molds. The allergenic molecules are then classified into protein families according to their structure and their protein and their function. The different molecules share common epitopes, and some other molecules have unique epitopes which are truly significant or unique markers for that allergen specificity. If you look at the 
the structural database for allergenic proteins that was mapped with the protein family database, you come up with a total of about 1,000, uh, 12,000 protein families that exist in, in, in our knowledge base. Of those, 236 of the, uh, of the families we believe have allergenic proteins associated with them, or 2%. And of these, 31 of the families contain multiple allergenic proteins, which we consider homologs or orthologs. So the allergen, allergens really comprise a very small fraction of the protein families of all of the protein biological families, and they are defined into certain families based on their biological structure and their function. They all share some basic common common properties, and as Rob Alberts from the Netherlands has shown us, most any protein can be an allergen, but all proteins are not allergens because either they're not pervasive or abundant in nature, or they're not stable to processing or digestion. Most allergens tend to aggregate or form polymers, so they are very good at cross-linking molecules and surfaces of cells like mast cells and basophils. And in terms of biological functions, they share either defense or transport, such as for lipid, lipid transport or calcium transport. It's important to remember that not every member of the protein family that we'll talk about is allergenic or cross-reactive. Now, I will approach the, the nine allergenic families uh, systematically, going from those that are most labile or least least likely to induce a severe allergic reaction, such as the profilins and albumins, to those that are the most stable to digestion and heat, and those are the lipocalins, the storage proteins, the parbalbumins, and the tropomycins. And we're going to go systematically through this, and I hope that you will, at the end, have some model allergen specificities you can link with each one of these families. Let's talk about the profilins first. The model example is BETV2 from Birch and PhilP12 from, from Timothy Grass. Those are allergens that will come back in our final, pres and final discussion as it relates to cross-reactivity in pollens. Now, profilins are really actin-binding proteins found in trees, grasses, weeds, and in foods. So they are very, very broadly represented across many of the pollens and the food of plant origin. They function as a dynamic to, di uh, to address the dynamic turnover and restructuring of the actin cytoskeleton. They are very reasonably sensitive to heat and digestion, and especially t uh, to cooked foods. So cooked foods are often tolerated. So they seldom induce very severe allergic reactions, but in certain cases where you in ingest a large quantity, they, the allergen before it can di get digested, can pass through into the system, and in some cases, in some individuals, can elicit some pretty severe reactions. And there's a high degree of cross-reactivity between these family families, and again, BETV2 and Termothy, uh, Phil P12 are the model allergens, along with uh, the latex allergen, HEB8. The second family that we'll talk about is the serum albumin family, and the examples I've given here are FELD2 and CANF3. Serum albumin is primarily found in animal sources, cow's milk, blood, beef, epithelia. It's a plasma carrier, nonspecifically binds hydrophobically to steroid hormones and transports proteins, and, uh, and also maintains the osmotic pressure. It's, they're also sensitive to heat and digestion, so clinically, clinical reactions to the albumins are pretty rare, even though we have this cat pork syndrome that's been identified. And there's a high degree of cross-reactivity among the species of this family, illustrated again by cat FELD2 and dog CANF3. Third are the pathogenic, pathogenesis-related proteins, the PR10 families, which are possibly the most interesting because they're so broadly cross-reactive with, e with each other. The three examples I'll give you are BETV1 Bet from Birch, which is the allergen that has been the, uh, the premier allergen in this group. Core A1 in hazelnut and MALD1 in apple. The pathogenesis related proteins are found in pollens, fruits, vegetables, and nuts. They are ribonucleases and steroid carrier molecules. They are, uh, the proteins are sensitive to heat and digestion, and often in cooked foods, they are very well tolerated. 
So often you'll find local symptoms such as oral allergy syndrome, but rarely will you find them eliciting more severe reactions. And the cross-reactivity in this family varies dramatically among the family. Now this is a lovely table from uh, Renata T uh, Treadler's uh, overview in which she illustrates the, the BETV1 homologs that are found in the pollens, of which BETV1 is a good example, in the stone, stone fruits and nuts. So you have apple and you have a whole variety such as cherry, kiwi, and then you also have illustrations in peanut of RAH8 and soybean, GLI-M4. Next are the pros, pole calcins, which are important, and the illust illustrative ones are BET V4 and Phil P7. They are found in the weeds, trees, and grasses, and not in the foods, and they're calcium binding proteins. They also regulate calcium uh, function. And they are moderately stable, which means, and there's a high degree of cross reactivity among this family. So, again, the illustrative ones we have selected are BET V4 and Phil P7. I've selected these in particular because when we talk about the components that are relevant to your use when you're dealing with pollen allergy assessment, the profilins and the polcalcins are the, are the cross-reactive components that you will want to know about that will allow you to identify cross-reactivity when it comes to multi-sensitized pollen-related individuals. The next group are the nonspecific lipid transfer proteins, RH. 9 in peanut, core 8 in hazelnut, and pru P3 in peach. These are found in fruits, vegetables, nuts, and pollens, and they're responsible for shuttling phospholipids and other fatty acids between cell membranes. They're stable to heat and digestion, thus they uh, cause reactions in cooked foods as well, and often are associated with systemic as well as more severe reactions, and in certain cases, also oral allergy syndrome as well. And the, uh, there's a high degree of cross-reactivity in this uh, family, keeping in mind that peanut, the RH9, and hazelnut core 8 and prup 3 are the ones that are most commonly thought of when we think of reactions that have been reported in the literature. The next family are the lipocalins, which the model are for cat and, and dog, Feldy 4 and 7, and CANF 1, 2, 4, and 6. These are, lipocalins are found pretty strictly in furry animal uh, sources, and they transport small hydrophobic molecules such as steroids, retinoids, and lipids. They're stable proteins in animals, and they, the degree of cross-reactivity does vary among the, the families. We have the next family, the parvalbumins, found uh, the example I, that we provide is cod, CAD D, CAD C1, and shrimp, cross C, C4 and 6. Parvalbumins are found primarily in the fish and amphibian extracts. They are calcium binding proteins involved in calcium signaling, localizing, localized in fast contracting muscle. They're stable to heat and digestion, and they thus cause reactions when one consumes them in foods. Often they're associated with systemic reactions and more severe reactions in addition to oral allergy uh, symptoms as well. And there's a high degree of uh, cross-reactivity among this family, um, among the fish and the, Croatia and the uh, Croatians. Next are tropomycins. The examples I'll give are DERP10 in dust mite and PEN-M1 in shrimp. The crustaceans, mites, cockroaches, and nematodes all share uh, or have tropomycins that are extractable. They are cell cytoskeleton. They regulate function of the actin filaments, both in muscle and in non-muscle. They're stable to heat and digestion, and they cause reactions in cooked foods. As a food allergen, they're often associated with systemic and more severe allergic reactions, and they have a high degree of species family cross-reactivity. So if you're allergic to dust mites and you happen to eat shrimp, even though you have never eaten shrimp, you might have some symptoms related to tropomycin cross-reactivity. The final family are the storage proteins, which are possibly the most important and the ones we will hear about most this evening. Uh, for peanut, it's RAH1, 2, and 3, and for hazelnut, CORE9 and 14. Storage proteins are found in seeds and nuts, 
They are nutri uh, nutrient storage. The examples are 2S albumins, and they're heterodimeric proteins, which are very stable with disulfide cross-linkages. Thus, they're stable to heat di and digestion, and they cause reactions in quick foods, often associated with systemic and more severe reactions in addition to oral allergy symptoms. And there's a low degree of cross-reactivity among the species within the family, even though uh, they're extremely stable, so they are very important and very critical allergens which elicit very severe reactions. So we have RH1, 2, 3, and 6 for peanut. Hazelnut, we have core A9 and 14. And we'll hear uh, about walnut and soybean, glyam 5 and 6. So after you finish mar marking up your sheet, it should look something like this. And if you can see the little lines, Hopefully, this will help you or give you some, some initial thought in preparation for when these exam questions come up for the, at least the fellows taking the board exams in the future. And, and the components, the family, the allergenic component families will ultimately emerge into the board exams because of their clinical relevance and their more common publishing, uh, being published in the literature. Now, let's talk briefly about technology. Here we have the three autoanalyzers which have been available for many years to measure IgE antibody in a singleplex mode where we measure individual allergenic components. They all have solophase allergens to which we bind IgE and then after a washing procedure we detect IgE that's bound with an anti-IgE that's, that's conjugated. Now each of these methods, the, uh, the immunocap in particular, has, um, has a solophase allergenic components available. And as time goes on, more and more of these components become available for singleplex analysis. And as, as we'll hear later, the, the theory or the philosophy will, in use of components will probably begin by doing an extract analytical measurement for IgE antibody to an extract of a particular allergen specificity to which you think the individual is sensitized. So if you suspect peanut, you might initially measure IgE antibody to peanut and follow that up with IgE antibody to Rh 1, 2, 3, 8, and 9, which are available on the singleplex assay. Later in 2000s, uh, 2000s, we actually had the Viennese group nicely put the, the allergen components into a matrix on a chip and made a very remarkable technology called the ISAC, which is the aminosor aminosorbent allergen chip. And this chip is illustrated here in simplicity. Basically, you take 30 to 40 microliters of serum, and you pipette it into one of the small squares in a chip that has four, four locations. Each of these squares contains, Ig, contains allergenic components in triplicate to 100, and now 112 individual allergen specificities. If Ig is present, it binds to the solophase allergen, we have a washing step like in the singleplex assay, and the, anti the Ig that's bound is detected with anti-IgE. The, the nicety of this assay is you can also detect IgG and IgG4 antibody measurements to the same allergenic components. And we'll, this will come up briefly in a moment. So once the assay is done, it's then put into a scanner, and we get a profile on the chip, which is very rapidly translated into quantitative data using a calibration curve. The, the data coming out of the ISAC chip is not considered to be as quantitative as in the singleplex assay, but it does have a relative quantitation level to it. Now, a very lovely study that was just presented in the, uh, ICE, in the, uh, it, the, the aller molecular allergy meeting in Vienna recently was a Euro European Union meeting where they set up a, a new chip called the METAL chip. Uh, where they were looking at mechanisms for the development of allergies, birth to adolescence cohorts with allergy and asthma. And this chip was unique in the sense that it actually had 170 individual allergenic components. And what I want to emphasize here is that if you're looking at the singleplex solophase, you're dealing with a single allergen cap, a single allergen cap that has one to two micrograms of allergenic protein. Whereas in a microarray dot, you have essentially 100 femtograms of allergenic protein. So you have 10 million times less protein on the chip spot than you have actually in the immunocap. 
And this has both an advantage and a, and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that the presence of IgG antibody, which binds to the same allergenic epitope as the IgE, will compete for limited sites on the chip and could displace or block or interfere with the IgE antibody binding. On the other side of the coin, this can be viewed as a positive in the sense that it looks, it's a potential for measuring the therapeutic effect of IgG antib blocking antibody in a particular serum as an individual goes through immunotherapy. So there are several ways to look at the IgG blocking issue. Now, on the upper uh, profile here, we have the IgE profiles for a particular patient that was run on the ISAC chip. And down below, we have the IgG profiles. So you'll see some reactivity in the IgG area that's not present in IgE, and also some IgG antibodies which are actually binding the same allergenic specificities and triplicate in the IgE. And the important point here is that in this chip, at a hundredfold molar excess of IgG to IgE, we get about 90% blocking of IgE binding to the chip. Whereas the same ratio of 100-fold molar excess in the immunocap, we get essentially zero interference because we have so much more allergen to bind IgE and IgG together. And so this is both a plus and a minus, and it's viewed in, in several ways but it's one of those special attributes of the, of the chip. And the ISAC is really nicely designed to look at the clinically relevant allergenic component specificities that are of interest to you as you're looking at multi-sensitized individuals. It has a whole variety of the PR10 families, the profilins, the transfer protein allergens, calcium binding allergens, the serum albumin family, and also the tropomycins. Now briefly, in advance of the next two speakers, which, who will be speaking on, food, on the applications of components to food allergy, I would like to turn your attention briefly to its, their applications in pollen allergy. And this was a beautiful paper that was presented uh, by Azero, an Italian, in which he presents the, the, the principal pollen allergen families. Now here we have the eight allergen families that exist for, for, that produce pollen allergens. And for example, we have here the, um, the grasses with the fill peas, and we have the birch pollen trees with the BET-V1 as a model. And in this major circle here, we have the, the allergen specificities, which represent unique specificities for that family. In the inner circles, we have the procalcins and the profilins, which are actually cross-reactive. And for Europeans, where in fact they like to elicit immunotherapy in individuals that, are molten, that have single sensitivities instead of those that have multiple sensitivities. Determining that an individual is primarily allergic to a tree and not to a cross-reactive allergen that in fact allows positivity to many of these other pollen allergens is, is a very important thing. So for example, in the, so one would take BETV1 as a, as a posit, IgE antibody to BETV1 as an illustration of IgE antibody to a birch tree pollen. But we also know that cross-reacts with the PR10 families in the foods. And each one of the, this, this, ta this, this paper is really nicely designed to give you a feeling for those allergenic components which are unique for pollens versus those that actually allow you to dissect out the cross-reactivity issues in individuals who are multiple sensitized to pollen allergens. We'll hear briefly and a little later about the, the, uh, the importance of components in differentiating sensitization to heat stable or digestion stable molecules at, which produce high risk for severe reactions versus those that produce low risk uh, for, for severe reactions. And finally, uh, we'll also hear about the importance of assessing pollen, uh, uh, polysensitized individuals with multiple allergen specificities from a single source, and, and the importance that high concentrations of even an allergen that's very digestible and very um, heat labile can overcome their properties and can, in some cases, elicit very severe reactions. The Canonica WAO consensus document is a very worthwhile document for you to read because it highlights the consensus 
actually of, of investigators across the world of the importance of molecular allergy diagnostics. And in this table, in this paper, we have a, a very nice table giving illustrations of those allergens that provide high risk for severe reactions versus those that elicit low risk. And again, it comes down to the issue of those being more stable and more heat, heat stable or digestible stable versus those that are least, least stable and therefore broken down. So in summary, molecular allergy diagnostics allows more discrimination and confirmation or exclusion of IgE sensitization in support of the clinical history-based diagnosis of allergic disease. Your history will ultimately always lead you to the ultimate decision about the presence or absence of the disease. The IgE measurement is simply an indication of sensitization that supports your clinical history assessment. It also allows you to define the sensitization profile, and this helps you in guiding better environmental control recommendations to reduce exposure to indoor and outdoor allergens as well as food allergens facilitates the assessment of cross-reactivity and risk assessment, and thus it improves the diagnostic accuracy and reduces, in some cases, the need for oral food challenges. And finally, it allows you to better discriminate those allergen specificities that are important for treating the individual for allergen immunotherapy. So with that, I'd like to close, and thank you very much for your attention.